Discovery Tour, what we wanted to do was to make people learn about ancient Egypt. Uh, our goal was really to make it accessible for uh, a bigger audience. Which are millions of people, but we also wanted to be more accessible, let's say, for museums, for classrooms, for anyone uh, that, would, that would be interested in learning about ancient Egypt, discovering mostly ancient Egypt. So all of this There's been a lot of discussion around the educational options for these Assassin's Creed games including the recent announcement of the Discovery Tour, The Viking Age, coming this fall. Whether you're an Assassin's Creed fan with a heart for history or a student looking to supplement your knowledge, the Discovery Tour Viking Age will have you covered. Discovery Tour is a new medium for immersive uh, virtual visiting of the past. As an intrigued historian, I plan on going into all this and more when the Discovery Tour comes out, but I'm disappointed by how many people miss the similar content that's in the game right now. It's even one of the longest running features in the series, and some of it's pretty helpful for understanding the overall context of the story and fully appreciating the world building. So without further ado, the unsung hero for historical information since day one, the database. <laughs> Uh, back in 2009, we started introducing the Animus database, which, is a, uh, which was an in-game encyclopedia, giving you some facts about uh, characters, about landmarks, about... If you've never checked out this section of the menu, what you can expect actually ranges from game to game slightly. For example, Syndicate's database entries are longer than my homework assignments, Brotherhood is where the original idea for NFTs came from, and some of them are written rather humorously with a mix of some in-game lore. Really just great fun for all. Yeah, it's not just databases though. Okay, um, with some careful analysis, we'll see how this database of information holds up. Of course, to be fair to an action-adventure game, we will evaluate this in comparison to a 2003 textbook that has been collecting dust in my classroom. You remember this thing, right? That's good, because it's pretty dated in just about every measurable way. Uh, reviewing the textbooks has, uh, has only um, reinforced that notion that the history we're teaching our students is severely distorted, uh, skewed, you might say. Which translates to empathy with the victors, thus comes to benefit the current rulers every time. So history is both written and taught by the class with the most wealth, power, and textbook victories. And many scholars even contend that there are similar goals to what Assassin's Creed this database is trying to achieve. History books from which many children are taught should be well written to make students interested in American history. We can and must do better. So we wanted to please our fans which are millions of people, but we also want Making this more of a matchup than you think. Whoa, 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 what about us, hey? Eh? You might actually need a historian down there. Regardless of which history textbook you grew up with, it's important to keep in mind that they've all done a lot of growing to get to the more current versions. There's a whole history behind how these books have been changing. So without going too deep into popular books like Lies My Teacher Told Me. James Lowen, author of Lies My Teacher Told Me. Can you remember a lie that your teacher told you and when? Oh yes. And describing things like historiography in textbooks. I'll leave a few suggestions below if you find any of this ongoing debate interesting. For this project, comparing the textbooks from California and Texas, they're the same editions. Um, they have the same author, same publisher, sometimes the same exact titles, but they've been customized for the students in the different states. Basically, this book is loaded with bias, misinterpretations of various cultures, and some facts and statistics that are just plain wrong. Uh, take this section on early civilizations using iron. The introduction of iron, probably from the Middle East, where it had first been used by the Assyrians. Um, not quite. It was actually the Hittites who were the first civilization known for their use of iron. And just as a quick aside, there's a German journalist, Johannes Lenemann, who's done some great work to present a case for the Hittites as a forgotten group that's right up there in stature with the Egyptians and the Babylonians. 
He, of course, blames people's lack of knowledge of the Hittites on textbooks. Either way, a perfect textbook is an impossible bar, so even if it had said something like the Assyrians were one of the earlier civilizations to produce iron, I'd probably still give it a B plus. Maybe that's nitpicking to you. But is it still a small problem if a study back in 2017 found over 300 of these kinds of errors? And even still, the bigger issue is a more difficult one to define. Let's take a quick look at what's off to the side on this section about chivalry. Talking about Braveheart is one thing, but praising Birth of a Nation, a movie that glorifies the KKK? It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. I get the point they are trying to make here. Epic poems are just like the movies and those kind of things that you kids love. But yikes, what an awful way to do it. And uh, even this part here that brings up the Song of Roland fails to mention its role in romanticizing the Crusades. In fact, it kind of reads like this particular conflict was justified, which it was not. Flipping the script for a quick minute, Valhalla's database has similar problems. Harold Fairhair is called the Great Unifier, but this conflicts with his representation in many of the sagas. Even the game's story has a better spin on this. And in Mercia, the thriving center for trade and industry? Not quite. They were known for their military strength, actually, according to historian Nick Brooks. Again, nothing outrageous, but I would just change some of these summaries a little bit. Basically, if a textbook is full of issues like these, why use it? Come on. Rip it out. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Gentlemen, tell you what, not just tear out that page, tear out the entire introduction. I want it gone. You could ask a similar question for the AC databases. Are they even still necessary? Some would argue that textbooks, like the databases in Assassin's Creed, are increasingly irrelevant. Man, it's one of my old textbooks. She always loved the pictures. It's an old federal textbook. We've replaced them with the corrected versions. Correct. Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. But at the end of the day, these should be sources for accessible, digestible, and well-written summaries. So the goal shouldn't be to do away with them, but... To become better. For me, a strong entry includes most of these five ingredients. And since this uh, game is about a very specific era in world history, We'll be analyzing that section to see how they compare. Obviously, there's more information in Valhalla because the database covers well over 100 topics, but a good number of these don't really matter much. Like, yes, it's nice that they poetically summed up Norway's environment or tell you where Winnie the Pooh originated from, but we're looking for stuff that's a bit deeper than that. Let's start with the visuals. People myself included, have been pointing out the flaws in the costumes, set designs, and aesthetics since the earliest trailers for Valhalla emerged. If they leave their house, they don't choke fur on their back to keep themselves warm. They put a cloak on, and then they put a pin in the cloak. Do you know why? Because Vikings don't actually want to look like barbarians. I know people so it would like be nice to see a few accurate depictions here in the game's glossary at the very least. But maybe the textbook doesn't follow the Hollywood trap, which, as you can see, they don't. Big win for the textbook here, even pointing out a common misconception and also attempting to display the scale of a real Viking longship by having one dominate the bottom of the page. Still, the textbook needs some help. This map fails to recognize Dublin as one of the most important trading ports in Western Europe at the time, and this map incorrectly portrays all of these interactions as invasions, ignoring the complexities of why and how these different groups expanded over time. The text literally fixes this on the next line, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's cut right to the most important part, the summary of the Vikings. This time, we'll start with the textbook, which is laughably horrendous. First of all, it's weak, 
Like, there's hardly any information here outside of what googling Vikings for 10 seconds would result in. And secondly, unforgivingly, it's boring. It essentially starts off with sailing Germanic peoples from a cold place, and then lets you know that they had warlike gods with no mention of a single one, and that they took pride in terrifying nicknames, but without any explanation as to why. Compare this to the more recent updated textbook, and it's easy to see the improvements that were made. On the Valhalla side, we have a very well-crafted overview of what a Viking is. Ubisoft addresses the phrase Viking itself and what it means. They attempt to explain the rating and nickname usage, and they offer insight into how the name Viking has shaped their depiction over time. I know many historians that would love to argue the various tones and statements here, like feats of bravery and as likely to trade as they were to kill, but as they are heavily leaning into a more positive depiction, since the game is meant to be a narrative from the Viking perspective, this is understandable. They were driven by the narrative of the game, so it, it was seamless. We're going to give this one to Ubisoft, credit where credit is due. They even landed the historian's touch in the section explaining the lost Drangers. And indeed, the connotations of this word are very similar to the connotations of the word badass in English. Flipping back to the textbook, and hey look, things are getting better. The Vikings were not only warriors, but also traders, farmers, and explorers. Not bad, although it would have been more important to mention that most Vikings were farmers. Sadly, there's no mention of social classes, thralls, complex all-thing legal systems. I mean, I'd be happy if they at least brought up any one of these things. But we are still giving this one to the textbook because while Valhalla explores all of these concepts in the game, their encyclopedia isn't exactly helpful for some of the impressive key terms that they drop. I even heard the phrase coffer get used once in a particular scene, which is a wildly specific use of 18th century language. It would be nice if they included any of these definitions in their database, but hey, maybe in the future. There's a few major historical figures mentioned in the textbook. We've got Leif Erikson, and um, they compare him to Christopher Columbus, and that's it. Compare that to the pantheon of celebrities that get the spotlight in the section on the Renaissance, a topic that some teachers even like to say. Furthermore, I'm gonna argue that the Renaissance didn't even necessarily happen. And that's pretty sad. Valhalla obviously dominates this round, but even that is an understatement. There's more gods here than God of War, all of the major historical figures get a blurb, and even more significant cultural world-building nuggets get dropped in with these. They're even starting to get a bit silly, which, yes, makes history more enjoyable and potentially fun. Excellent work here, Ubisoft. Checking back in with the textbook, it wraps things up pretty quick. We get a conclusion addressing, but not accurately explaining, the lessening of Viking raids. Okay, incorrectly might be a bit harsh, but the Christianizing didn't directly lead to the end of the Viking Age. That makes it sound like Christianity was the sole solution. It was not. Raiding became less popular when the slave trade declined, and the Vikings started to usurp powers from the kings that they've toppled. There's many theories here. Some of them are quite interesting. Perhaps they were inspired by the craftsmen who expected them to behave just like their royal patrons many of those of Norse abandoning sea raiding and instead becoming powerful landowners, then making further money through taxing craftsmen in their trades and industries, and minting new coins to collect these taxes. In the case of York, the Norse king minted coins with his face on one side and the local bishop on the other, suggesting that they were accommodating, if not outright adopting, the traditional trappings of Christian kingship. Of course, the older kingdoms, Western Europe, had also evolved during this time. The one remaining contender in England, the Kingdom of Wessex, got its act together eventually and knocked out the York-based Danelaw. In Francia, the kings took up the policy of, if you can't beat them, join them, and then allowed Norman Vikings to become a regular part of their kingdom. This point would go to Valhalla, but they really don't have much on the end of the Viking Age. So, everyone cool with no points being awarded to either side? Alright, maybe we'll get an update in some future DLC or something like that. I mentioned earlier that some of these get rather silly, and again, I'm all for that, but it's when they start to drift away from real history that I get a little worried. I get that the database is supposed to exist in the universe and backstory of the game, 
I understand the lore and that aspect. However, there are many times when it reads as pretty believable history, at least to those not versed in the canon, and that to me is problematic. Take for example this section on Owen. I couldn't find any record of this person ever existing in my research, um, and he's not alone. There's full backstories on characters that really aren't even real, and again, it's not always easy to tell the difference. The most unforgivable of these cases would be the new section called Culture and History that contains songs in both Gaelic and English. When I first saw this, it blew my mind. It seems as though they were about to include an actual primary source in their database. Yet, after even a few hours of research, I haven't been able to confirm that this is an actual thing either. I'd be more than happy to be proven wrong here, but this is so discombobulating. I really have no choice but to deduct a point on Valhalla's side. It's misleading, disappointing, and a definite step in the wrong direction for the database. And with that, there's really not much more to say, so we'll call it a match. If I had to give a history rating for both of these, I'd probably give them both a slightly passing 6 out of 10, and simply say, proceed with caution. Both of these sources of history show some strong summaries, but ultimately many flaws in their writing and their visuals. Personally, I think classrooms will always be in need of a textbook that hangs out in the back of the room, just as any game set in history should include a database like this that shows where the real history is. Fortunately, we're left with a mixed bag from both ends and uh, really just a lot of potential. In the end, it's up to you though. After acknowledging that no source can be perfect, how many flaws are too many flaws? Are there some errors here or poor word choices that cut deeper than others? Should one or both of these not be taken seriously, even in the slightest? Whatever your thoughts, it's important for the discussion. Let me know what you think.